um, put that out there for everyone. And so we know this redetermination process is going to be really challenging for Medicaid recipients, navigators, advocates, and Medicaid agencies. Um, for example, states like Arkansas have announced that they plan to complete the process in six months, despite agency staffing shortages and whatever other hurdles may arise. Other states are planning to take the full year allowed, but we know they will still have challenges tracking down enrollees, getting up-to-date income information, and staffing Medicaid eligibility offices. So in this webinar, we will talk with experts and give you tools to help Medicaid enrollees throughout the redetermination process so you know what to do when red flags pop up because we know that they are going to. Um, and so our experts today are Jennifer Tolbert at KFF, Sandy Rubalid at the Nevada HHS Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy, and Allison Miles Lee at DC Spread for the City. As you have questions for them as they go through their presentations, feel free to put them in the chat for the Q&A portion that follows. Um, and so we'll start with Jennifer, who's the Director of State Health Reform at KFF and an Associate Director for the Program on Medicaid and the Uninsured. Ms. Tolbert leads an initiative to monitor state implementation of the Affordable Care Act with a particular focus on state efforts to establish health insurance marketplaces. And then we'll hear from Sandy Rubalid, the Deputy Administrator and Chief IT Manager who has been with the Nevada Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy since 2002. She began her career with the State of Nevada in 1994 in workers' compensation insurance and has over 25 years in the healthcare insurance industry with a focus on Medicaid management information systems. And finally, we'll hear from Allison Miles Lee, a managing attorney at Bread for the City, where she manages Bread's public benefits unit and supervises their in court child support project. She also provides family law representation for survivors of domestic violence in civil protection order, custody, and divorce proceedings. Um, so we're kind of having a like a view from a national organization, a uh, state, and then we'll like zoom in on a specific local uh, organization in DC, which is spread for the city. Um, and so now I'll turn it over to Jen to talk about what the dating reporting will show us. Thanks, Garrett. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, how we can use data to monitor um, how states are doing with unwinding the Medicaid continuous enrollment provision, um, both the, you know, what we can learn from the data as well as the limitations um, that we will face. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Garrett already uh, provided information, much of the information on this slide, um, but I did just want to point out two important things that the Consolidated Appropriations Act also did in, in addition to ending continuous enrollment on March 31st. Uh, it, uh, it increased the number of uh, reporting requirements and monthly reporting metrics for states um, that they must uh, uh, provide uh, to CMS on a monthly basis. And then importantly, the CAA also requires CMS to make public all of the data um, that states are reporting. So I think that is an important uh, step and development in ensuring that there will be data that we will be able to use to monitor how things are proceeding across states. So next slide, please. Um, so here is the list of metrics that states must report. Um, they include data on renewals initiated, the number of people um, whose coverage is renewed, both on a total as well as an ex parte basis. Um, and then it um, obviously uh, information on the number of people who are disenrolled and uh, broken out by uh, for children, uh, pregnancy related coverage, as well as other coverage. Um, and I will note, importantly, uh, the requirements also specify uh, that states must report not just total disenrollments, but disenrollments um, for procedural reasons. So um, where in a situation where someone was unable to complete the re uh, renewal process, maybe they didn't get the renewal notice in the mail or couldn't provide the required documentation. Um, there's also information related to what happens to people once they are disenrolled, 
uh, the number of children who are able to enroll in a separate CHIP program, as well as the number of people who can enroll in a qualified health plan on the marketplace. And then finally, the reporting requirements also include data on call centers, call center volume, wait times, and aban uh, average abandonment rates. Next slide, please. So, um, well, I'll go ahead and keep talking. There we go. Um, so I'll just note on this slide that um, the CAA also provided with C CMS with enhanced enforcement authority if a state is not complying with the reporting requirements. And some of these are pretty um, significant. So a potential of up to one percentage point reduction in uh, federal matching payments for a state in a quarter in which it's not complying. Uh, required submission and implementation of a uh, corrective action plan. And then CMS can actually uh, require a state to suspend disenrollments for procedural reasons if it has identified a problem and until uh, it feels like uh, the state has taken appropriate corrective action. So hopefully just the threat of these enforcement mechanisms will encourage states to report all of the required uh, data metrics. Next slide, please. And so while all of these uh, metrics are important for monitoring how well the alignment is going, um, from my perspective, certain metrics um, will be more immediately useful. So in particular, call center data. Um, as my colleague, Trisha Brooks at uh, Georgetown Center for Children and Families has frequently said, these data can serve as the canary in the coal mine and identify early problems. So we see increases in call center volume uh, and, and wait times, that's a sign that um, people are having problems, um, either completing their renewals, maybe they're losing coverage, trying to get their coverage reinstated, they're getting notices that they don't understand, they don't know what actions they need to take, so they're calling the agency to try and get more information. And so as that call center, wait, uh, call center volume increases and wait times increase, that can be a sure sign that things are going awry on the ground level. And then obviously monitoring total disenrollments um, and disenrollments for procedural reasons will be critical. But here I think um, there is important context that will be needed to interpret the data. So as we know, states are required to develop a plan for how they will prioritize renewals and some states are focusing first on individuals that they have flagged as potentially being no longer eligible, um, while others are relying um, more on uh, the existing renewal dates. So basically renewing people when they come up for renewal based on their original either application or previous renewal date. Um, and so the choices that states make in terms of prioritizing these renewals will actually have an effect on the number of disenrollments that occur in a given month. So for states um, that are flagging potentially ineligible individuals, they will likely have very high disenrollment rates at the beginning of the unwinding period. Um, and so those disenrollment rates then should taper off and should uh, decrease as they move from people that they, they have identified as no longer eligible to people who they think continue to be eligible. So in those states, if the disenrollment rates start high and remain high, um, you know, past the first few months, that's a signal that maybe there's um, something going wrong there. And then alternatively, in states that are adopting more of a time-based approach, you would expect, expect to see uh, disenrollment rates kind of at a steadier level uh, throughout the unwinding process because likely in any given month they are renewing as many people who are uh, likely to be determined ineligible as who are uh, remain eligible. So in those states if we're seeing high disenrollment rates at the beginning of the unwinding period that could be a sign uh, that that something is is not right or if there are spikes for example during um, in any months during the year that could be a signal that um, things are uh, not not going well for some reason or another. Um, so next slide, please. But another important consideration is the timeliness of these unwinding data. Um, so data that are lagged by several months uh, will be much less useful at identifying problems. Um, 
as you know, sort of identified problems as they occur compared to more current data, more recent data. So for example, um, CMS releases monthly Medicaid enrollment data. And while these data are great at showing what is happening um, uh, across states in terms of, and this is showing uh, enrollment growth during the pandemic, so since uh, February of 2020, um, these data are lagged by three months. Um, and so while that's less of a problem for these particular data where we're seeing uh, enrollment increases, if we're dealing with the same uh, lag in reporting of the unwinding data, it could mean millions of people could inappropriately lose coverage before we even know that there is a problem. So I think, um, you know, uh, trying to identify uh, more timely data uh, is going to be important. Uh, next slide, please. And so one way to do this is that um, some states have committed to posting unwinding data on their websites. So whether it be the uh, monthly report that they're sending to CMS or some other uh, dashboard or data report, uh, you know, a number of states are, are uh, have said they will post these data. And these data are more likely to be current and reflect uh, the current month. So these are examples of uh, unwinding dashboards and reports from three states. Utah on the left, that's showing actually uh, call center data. And then uh, in the middle is Louisiana. And then on the right hand side is um, Minnesota. And, um, but you can see here, one of the downsides of going to the state level data is the data are all presented differently um, and may include, in fact, different metrics because um, not all states, well, not all states are committed to uh, even posting these data, but among states that have, they may not be posting the full comprehensive set of data that they are uh, reporting to CMS, CMS on a monthly basis. So it may be a subset of those data. And again, it may be presented in a slightly different way. So I think these data will be useful for monitoring um, what's happening in a single state and will be a little less useful for uh, comparing how things are, are going across states. Again, because it'll be time consuming to pull the data and the data may not be consistent. So next slide, please. So I think in short, for those of us who are trying to, uh, and planning to use these data to monitor um, how the unwinding is going across states, we're gonna likely have to pull data from multiple sources. Now my hope is, and I think CMS will be the best source for all of the comprehensive data simply because of the CAA requirements. They will be posting all of the data that uh, states are sending to them. Um, but there may be lags in uh, the data reporting. And in fact, in, in uh, conversations with stakeholders and, and in various webinars and meetings, CMS officials have sort of tried to lower expectations uh, about um, how uh, and when the, that first tranche of unwinding data will be available um, and how, and frankly, how complete those data will be. Now, my expectation is that data quality and timeliness will improve over time. Um, but it may be challenging in those first few months um, to use uh, DF, CM, uh, data reported by CMS as a monitoring mechanism. So I've noted that we can also go to state websites. Uh, that will be another source. So I've also talked about some of the limitations there. Um, and I will note that um, we here at KFF, along with other organizations here in DC, I know, for example, uh, the Center for Children and Families, as well as the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and I'm sure there are others as well as um, state level organizations are gonna be developing uh, enrollment trackers and, and dashboards that will pull together as, as much of the data as we can to try and uh, paint a picture of how things are going. Um, I think the utility there is that we will try and do some assessments of how things are going and and make some uh, statements about uh, what may be happening across states. But again, we are facing the same data quality and timeliness challenges that uh, that uh, you know that 
CMS will be dealing with and, and states themselves. So, um, you know, that, that I think will be an important source, another important source of data. But again, I, I think that and uh, I will end with this, which is uh, unfortunately, while these data are going to be critical to our ability to monitor how things are going, they are not going to be a panacea. Um, and they can't be the only tool that we use uh, to assess how how things are going and how states are doing. And so we'll take folks like you on the ground, talking with enrollees, creating feedback loops so that um, we can uh, have multiple ways of identifying um, potential problems and then feeding that information back to both states as well as to CMS. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Danny. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, that's such an important preview of the data reporting um, from CMS and the states themselves. Um, and I, I just before I turn it over to Sandy, I just want to say it's such it's so great seeing the chat and all the states that are here today, seeing a lot of navigators that are present. Um, so we're really happy to have you all. And so yeah, now we'll turn it over to Sandy to talk about Nevada's plans to monitor and troubleshoot the unwinding process. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Sandy Rublid. Um, as Garrett shared, I am a deputy administrator and chief IT manager for the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy, which is a really long way of saying Nevada Medicaid. Um, so first, um, I'll start with a bit of background on Nevada Medicaid's program, who we cover, and how we're structured to help give you a sense of the impact. So Nevada's population is just over 3.1 million. Um, we are the seventh most extensive or expansive state, but the ninth least densely populated state. So we have two very urban areas, and then the, the remainder of the state is, is very rural. So we have about 920,000 people enrolled in our program today. We cover one in three Nevadans. Uh, we are an expansion state since 2014. And since the pandemic, we've grown by 42%. And uh, according to a study by the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, about 37% of the uninsured are likely eligible for Medicaid in the state of Nevada. Next slide. So here are some more statistics about Medicaid um, in Nevada. I'd just like to highlight that Medicaid does cover 55% of the births in Nevada and 78% of our members are served by managed care. And so, um, as I said, we, we have two major urban counties in Nevada, Washoe, which covers Reno, and Clark, which is Las Vegas. Um, those are both our managed care counties. And so that makes them very important partners in this planning phase, especially um, regarding communications. And then I'd also highlight that 80% of our recipients live in Clark County or the Las Vegas area. So it makes it a little bit easier to target communications. Uh, next slide. And so here's a visual of how Nevada Medicaid is structured. So of course we have CMS as our federal partner at the top. Um, the single state agency as designated by CMS is um, the Department of Health and Human Services. And then beneath the department, we have two divisions. Uh, DHCFP, which is the division that I work for, administers the state plan for Medicaid. And we contract with our partners um, at the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services to perform the eligibility determinations. And so we are a state-based eligibility determination. We don't have counties making eligibility determinations, which makes it a little bit simpler for, for this project. Um, and we also have a state-based health insurance exchange, and it's called the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange because we are the Silver State. So <laughs> next slide. Okay, so I, now I'll go into our um, next slide, our unwinding approach. And so what did continuous coverage look like in Nevada? So Nevada did not stop doing renewals. We only did not do disenrollments. And so if a redetermination packet was returned and the family was deemed eligible, they were renewed for 12 months. If it was not returned, um, the caseworker then extended the eligibility manually for six months. And then because at, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, we had no idea that this was gonna go on for three years. So we were kind of incrementally hoping that it would end sooner. So, so that's how we picked the six month timeframe. 
Um, so we also do not have a backlog of applications. And when I say that does not mean we don't have any pending applications. What that means is that we don't have any applications that are over 45 days as required by CMS for processing. Um, and because no major system changes were made, we don't have to undo those system changes. So it does make us unwinding a little bit simpler. And then as Garrett explained, um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act did finally set an end date to the continuous coverage requirement as March 31st. And so in Nevada, our unwind process is beginning on April 1st, so a month from today. Next slide. Okay, planning. So um, it feels like almost a year, but I think it's been around 10 or 11 months that um, I was asked to lead this effort in the state across the three entities that that really administer coverage in Nevada. So um, we have DHCFP, we have welfare and supportive services, and then we have our exchange. And so these are you know, the three pillars of how you get coverage um, for this population. And so what we started with was very important, I can't stress this enough, is formal project management. This is not something that's easily coordinated across three you know, distinct agencies within the state. And so that that has been key, and I have a, an amazing project manager, Vanessa, that has helped us tremendously get through this process. Um, and so it starts with formal project management and then developing the plan. That plan was painfully developed between all three agencies, everyone getting on board with what the plan, what we could commit to. We also posted the plan publicly for, for transparency and accountability reasons. So um, we're really proud of this plan. It's, it's really comprehensive. Um, so we also have regular partner meetings with all involved, including our managed care organizations. Um, we've got had a multimedia uh, member outreach, so that information is available on our website. Um, one of the things that we did that I'm really proud of that sounds really simple, but we developed a web form so that members could simply add, update their address. So they could just go onto this web page, put in their information, and that generates an email to a dedicated unit at our Division of Welfare and Supportive Services to update their contact information. So they don't have to do it during business hours. They don't have to have a password, a PIN, anything complicated. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just a simple way to tell us that they've moved. And so that's been really instrumental as well. Uh, we also um, did some changes with our ex parte process, which I'll go into an, a little bit later. And we are one of the states that is committed to post our dashboards um, online. So we're excited about that. Uh, so next slide. So communications. So we, we did, like many states, a two-phased approach. The first phase, which I feel like has been going on for quite some time, was about updating your address. So we really wanted to make sure that we could reach people when we needed to reach them. So that's been very, very important. And that has you know, involves social media, flyers, post, flyers posted in clinics, emails, texting with our managed care plans. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but I would say the MCOs are a, a pivotal partner for us because they have resources that the states don't have. Um, and they have flexibilities that the states don't have. Um, and our MCOs in Nevada also offer products on the exchange. And so they're highly uh, motivated to ensure that people remain insured. So <laughs> for lots of reasons. So that makes them a great partner um, aside from all other reasons. And then our health insurance exchange has also been instrumental in getting the message out there. They, they also have available, you know, resources available to them that, that maybe the Medicaid agency doesn't. So we did do our first targeted message, which was, which is part of phase two. Uh, we emailed over 330,000 Medicaid members and we will continue to send out, update your contact information, renewal and renewal transition messages weekly, uh, starting April 1st and then monthly thereafter. And we are working on a texting solution. Um, I think, I don't know if many of you may not know, but the FCC has been challenging for states in this regard because we don't, again, have the resources necessarily to do a complete text campaign. Um, but recently we did have a ruling that says that if a member gives you their phone number on their Medicaid application, then that's, that's express consent and you are allowed to use it for this purpose. So that was really, really helpful. And so now what we are doing is exploring how do we do that? 
you know, we, we certainly aren't gonna have all of our Medicaid, you know, employees texting people. We, we need a technology solution to do that. So we're looking at those. And we're also um, enhancing our account transfer process to include more information so that our health insurance exchange can do the outreach to the members who have lost Medicaid for being over income or for other various reasons. So <clears throat> next slide. Okay, ex parte. So I had to learn what that term actually meant through this process. Um, so it, it essentially means that you're doing something on behalf of someone, which is really interesting. So um, what we learned in Nevada is we, we were doing it manually for a very limited population. So that was our first you know, low hanging fruit of how do we get through this process and, and have the least amount of disruption. So we are um, now matching up to five data sources. We went live in December of 2022 and we've been processing renewals for again, that 12 months of eligibility. Those who are not able to be renewed through this process do get a packet in the mail. Um, if they return it, we process it. If they don't, we're extending again by six months. Um, so what that means is on average since December for January's renewals, over 16,000 households have been renewed per month without having to do anything. So they don't have to return a piece of paper. They don't have to prove anything to us. It just happens. They get a notice in the mail and they're good for another 12 months. Um, so of those eligible for ex parte, we're currently at about a 50% renewal rate. So we're still working towards you know, upping that rate, but it's a, it's a new process for us. So we're, we're still working out the bugs. So I'm really excited that we went live in December instead of April. So <laughs> that's really helpful. Um, so I think this will have a, a lasting positive impact on our enrollment well beyond, you know, the unwinding process. Next slide. Okay, so this is a really um, hard slide to read probably, um, but it is part of our unwinding plan if, if you're interested, but basically it just kind of illustrates that we will begin April 1st, but our first termination will not occur in, until June 1st. And then you have a 90 day reconsideration window. And we are um, a time based, we are processing an order of due date for those renewals. Um, and we, are, we chose the longest possible unwind period available. So we are extending that. And on average, we will be processing about 54,000 households per month between April and October. Um, why that time period is important is because the way that we approach the um, continuous coverage is we continue coverage for six months at a time. And so we feel like probably in the first six months is gonna be the bulk of our redeterminations. Next slide. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is something I just wanted to highlight because it's not often that Nevada is um, in the top 10 in many things <laughs> so <laughs> that are positive. So uh, this is something that we were really excited about in that this tracker examines whether the following information could be found on the state website, marketplace website, or in public publicly available documents, which helps all sorts of you know, foundations and, and different entities in their research. And so we met all of the criteria and are in the top 10 for these. Um, so we have our state plan posted publicly. We have alerts to update contact information. We have FAQs and guidance, communication toolkits, and we do plan on posting our dashboard publicly. Next slide. Okay, CMS and stakeholder collaboration. Next slide. So there has, you know, since the beginning of the unwinding process, uh, we've, CMS has been really, really helpful as far as technical assistance. We've also been working closely with the National Association of Medicaid Directors, state health and value strategies. We have technical calls almost daily with different entities that where we try to make sure that we're staying up on, you know, released guidance, making sure we're learning from other states, um, trying to leverage and, and put ourselves in the best position possible. CMS is also working with each state one-on-one -on -one to address mitigation strategies. 
So our mitigation plan for Nevada is set to be released on March 13th. Um, it will outline items that we can start addressing prior to the renewal process beginning. And then any new information we, we learn on any of these stakeholder technical assistance calls, we do share with our sister agencies, our managed care organizations in the marketplace. Next slide. Monitoring. Okay, next slide. And so um, Jennifer did a great job of explaining all the CMS reporting requirements, so I won't go into that. Thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, we are planning to use that information to feed into our anointing dashboards, which are going to be posted publicly. I agree wholeheartedly with the timeliness of this information and it being not necessarily helpful for us to react and respond to because it is, you know, months behind in some cases. So, so I think call center metrics are going to be one of the most important things that we monitor, which can be monitored uh, on a more regular basis. And then we also, um, the Department of Health and Human Services in Nevada has an office of analytics. And that office has um, various dashboards that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, not necessarily related to unwinding that, that we monitor you know, program effectiveness. But we also did a, a deep dive into <clears throat> who we feel like are at risk for losing eligibility because they're going to be over the income threshold. And so I have a link here in the presentation and at the end of the presentation, or you can go to this website and find it. Um, next slide. And so here's a snapshot of part of the report and some facts about this population. And so 77% had at least one healthcare service from a core service provider in the past year. So all of these are based on the past year of Medicaid claims data. 50% had seen a physician specialist with an average of eight specialist visits. 45% had seen primary care providers with an average of four visits. 9% had seen a behavioral health provider with an average of about 11 visits per individual. And so this is important information to be aware of. It's also mapped by demographics, zip code, that sort of thing, so that we can, you know, these, these members are utilizing services and we're paying for those services. So this is not an insignificant event that is going to occur. And so we need to really make sure that they have a soft landing to coverage, whether that's employer sponsored or through the exchange. Next slide. Okay, so here are just some closing thoughts on, on Nevada's approach. I think we've been, um, like many states, focusing on you know, mitigating the risk of terminations for procedural reasons and ensuring that there's a soft landing to the state marketplace. We partnered with our managed care plans for communications. And again, because they offer plans on the exchange, they're also helpful with that navigation piece. Um, due to our approach to unwinding, it's gonna be an incremental over the longest allowable time frame. Uh, we'll closely monitor the results using our dashboards and react as we can. But I would note, as many states are facing, we do have a severe staffing shortage within our Welfare and Supportive Services Agency, which is going to dramatically affect our ability to staff up call centers or even eligibility workers to assess during this time frame. So that is our probably our biggest concern that we don't know what we can do to mitigate at this point. Um, so I would say we're planning and hoping for the best. Um, we are currently exploring the feasibility of augmenting our call center to handle the increased volume of calls at minimum, potentially to navigate members to the right place. Um, you can't train someone to be an eligibility worker in the amount of time that we have to do this, right? I mean, it, it's very complex work, but if we can at least answer the phone and get someone to the right place, that might be the best we can do from a state perspective. Slide. And then that concludes my presentation of what Nevada is doing. Thanks so much, Sandy. Really appreciate the insights into how Nevada is planning to protect coverage, including the newly automated ex parte renewals. I think that will be huge, as, as you also shared. Um, and so now I'll turn it over to Allison to talk about the recertification for DC's Healthcare Alliance population. Great, thanks, Garrett. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, next slide. 
Um, so as Garrett said before, I am, I, I do not work in Medicaid. Um, I'm a lawyer at a nonprofit in DC called Bread for the City. Um, and we uh, serve DC residents living with low incomes. Um, we have a medical clinic, um, legal clinic, social services, food, among other things. Um, and we have um, been getting a lot of referrals from our medical clinic, specifically with um, assistance with Alliance Recertification, which is a local um, DC government funded health insurance program that I'll talk a little bit more about. Next slide. So DC Healthcare Alliance is um, it, pretty unique, um, it, at least in the, the DC metro area. Um, there, the, it's something that's not available in the other states nearby. Um, it's locally funded. Um, it's essentially for people that would qualify for Medicaid, um, except for their uh, uh, immigration status. Um, so it's a lot of undocumented immigrants, but not just undocumented immigrants. It's people who don't yet qualify for Medicaid um, because they don't have enough years in legal permanent resident status, for example. And for Alliance, Alliance and Medicaid recertifications um, are going to be similar. It's They're going through the same system now. Um, and it's the same DC government agencies, um, Department of Human Services and Department of Healthcare Finance that are handling the recertifications. Um, and they, um, or I should say DC does have a passive renewal process for Medicaid um, that many people will be able to use, but for those that can't, um, they'll be going through the same process as Alliance recipients. So for Alliance, um, recertifications were suspended during the public health emergency. They were briefly restarted, um, I think in the fall of 2021, if I remember correctly, so many people lost their coverage um, that the government immediately suspended, um, I think after one month suspended recertifications. Um, and then now they have started recertifications again um, as of last summer, uh, and they're, they are happening. Um, and so Jen talked about early data being the canary in the coal mine for us. Alliance recertifications have really been the canary in the coal mine um, for upcoming Medicaid recertifications. So in DC, um, it's, it's had a profound impact. Only about 17,000 DC residents are on Alliance. Medicaid, more than 300,000 is what we're looking at. Next slide, please. And so the way that Alliance recertifications are supposed to be working now um, is notices are mailed out uh, that contain the recertification paperwork. So a packet that people can fill out and return. Um, there's also a new online action, uh, option called District Direct, which is both a phone app um, and an online application that people can use. Um, you can also upload verifications directly online uh, and review any of your notices uh, online as well. Um, the government has said you can also drop off recertifications in person, you can mail them in, um, and you can fax them in. Next. So our concern in a nutshell, I tried to do this on, on one slide, is that people are submitting recertifications for Alliance, um, either in person or through the online portal, and they're still being terminated. And what we're seeing in many cases is it's not that they're being processed and denied, um, they're just not being processed. Um, and so the result is delayed healthcare. So people, um, I had one client with a suspected broken arm who didn't go in to seek medical care for a month and a half until we got her alliance back on. Um, people facing emergency room bills because they do have to go to the emergency room um, and people who are not able to get their prescriptions for many months. Next slide. And so um, I just want to flag a couple of the issues that we're seeing. And then I do have some takeaways, some things that we've learned along the way um, that might be helpful as um, particularly advocates uh, on this on this call may find helpful. Um, and so what we're seeing is with the new district direct system, just unexplained system glitches. Um, that's what they're that's what the government representatives are calling them. Um, and often it, it involves getting tech support involved in a particular case to manually override something to get somebody um, insured. 
um, there are verifications being requested that are not actually required. And so the person's um, application, or sorry, recertification is not able to proceed through the system online because it looks like it's still waiting for something. Um, people are having difficulty just uploading documents. They may not be tech savvy enough to be able to do that um, or don't know that they're required to upload things. They think they've submitted the recertification. That's all they need to do. Um, as I mentioned in DC, they started Alliance recertifications, then suspended them. And now they're starting again. Um, a lot of people may not take it seriously, may not actually realize that this is this is really happening this time. Um, and then we see research notices going out without any paperwork to fill out. And so people don't understand what it is that they're supposed to turn in. Next slide. Continued, <laughs> we're seeing dropped off documents being lost. Um, it's not clear what's happening um, because it doesn't seem in most cases that they're actually being lost. They're just not, uh, because later when we contact the agencies, um, they're able to find them somewhere in the system um, if we reach out. Um, and then the online recertification is just not a good alternative option for many people that lack the tech skills. A lot of these folks, because it's primarily immigrants, um, don't speak English. Uh, in DC, we have a language access law that requires the government to send out notices um, uh, for the for alliance applicants, likely in in Spanish and Amharic as well as English. Um, but we still see notices going out in English, even though the person has self identified as limited or non English proficient on their original application, um, and just poor treatment, um, failure to provide language access, but other poor treatment of limited non English proficient people when they try to go into service centers to recertify. And then even when we escalate these up when lawyers like me get involved and we um, file a fair hearing request to go to the Office of Administrative Hearings, which is how you appeal decisions um, about alliance determinations, um, we are finding that judges are ordering the agency to take action. So ordering that benefits be reinstated, that insurance be reinstated, um, and they're, it's just not happening. It's still not happening, even though there's no substantive disagreement, it's just some sort of issue with the system that's not allowing people to get put back in. Next slide. Uh, so just want to highlight some positive changes that have come out, out of the pandemic and kind of um, DHS and Department of Healthcare Finance rethinking how they're doing some of these things. So for Alliance, the recertification period was changed from six months to one year. So now folks that are recertifying will only need to do this um, once a year. And then the in-person interview requirement was uh, removed. Um, and so there's no need to go in person and wait um, all day potentially to have that in-person interview in order to recertify. Um, like I mentioned before, there is an online option, though not, uh, not the best option for everyone. And then we advocates have created a working group specifically to deal with these system problems that we're seeing with District Direct. So it's a group of advocates kind of across um, different types of advocacy areas. So instead of just having a group of lawyers that meets to talk about the fair hearing process and medical clinics to talk about um, you know, issues with patients, this is a group that we created. Um, so healthcare providers, um, medical clinics in DC, federally qualified healthcare centers, lawyers for different free legal services organizations, um, and then community workers, so people working with families in schools, um, people that may be working with families at different nonprofits and assisting them. Um, we're all coming together, uh, I think it's every three weeks at this point, um, but as District Direct was rolled out, it's been really, really helpful to have this group of advocates that are all kind of seeing things from different angles and we can share what we're seeing um, and then come together to, to kind of um, talk with the agencies and, and demand change. Um, for its part, um, Department of Healthcare Finance did come up with a specific email address uh, that's for Alliance recertification problems. Um, so I would recommend that um, other, you know, government agencies in, in other states come up with a contact person or a group of people that's going to be checking an email address. Um, it, this one was not a particular person's email. It was um, 
DHCF Alliance Research uh, is the email address. And um, that, that was a commitment that they made to advocates to kind of be checking that regularly so that we're not also banging our head on the wall, um, trying to push things through. Um, and we've also, we're also working with the healthcare finance ombudsman. Um, so they are from within healthcare finance, um, kind of gathering data about people that are having trouble recertifying for Alliance. Um, and so they've asked um, different community organizations to send um, names and information of people that we've worked with on a weekly basis. So they're kind of amassing data so they can see, um, you know, what is going on with these problems of Alliance recertification. Next slide. And then um, things that still need to be improved on uh, and to think about for Medicaid recertifications as they're coming up. Um, the online system needs to be improved. The language needs to be more layperson language and easy to understand. Um, DHS, um, as, as in Nevada, um, doesn't have, you know, as much staff as it needs to process recertifications. Um, so whether it's processing online recertifications or in person, um, part of the problem is definitely um, not having enough people to timely get through them. Um, one thing that we, we are recommending that they do is consider having kiosks at service centers where staff could help people use District Direct so that people are inputting data into their own recertifications um, with folks there available to help out, but not actually sitting, having to sit down one by one going through the recertification with people. Um, and then really important, um, providing receipts for people who drop off things in person. That's not something that DHS is doing regularly now, and we are we want them to have a uniform receipt um, so people can, can prove they dropped something. And then just thinking through better ways for advocates to escalate. So, you know, if we're not getting responses from this special email address that was created, um, we need to know the next next step up like what's what should the flow look like um so that we're helping as many people as quickly as we can next slide and that's the end thank you thanks Allison. i know you're still in the thick of like responding to all of these issues and so we really appreciate all your work trying to protect people's coverage um and i think a lot as you mentioned i think a lot of what you talked about is relevant to the rest of the country and what everyone will be experiencing about a month from now. And so it's a good segue to our Q&A. Uh, we had a question come in, I think from a Colorado attendee who said that Colorado Medicaid has promised to share data on a quarterly basis in as quarterly meetings scheduled through October of this year. And the request for monthly data and county breakdowns has not been granted, but they're still trying. So Jennifer, do you know if advocates in other states have had success asking their states to post publicly their data? Um, yeah, in fact, if you can, I think you had a link uh, to the uh, Georgetown CF, uh, CCF unwinding tracker. Um, and actually they've done a fantastic job of identifying which states have indicated they will be posting data on their websites. And I suspect in some cases, you know, these are states that have been data savvy in the past. And so, you know, it's not surprising that they have decided to uh, make these data available. But in other states, I think it's clear that, um, the advocates were successful at making this request and encouraging the state to decide to post the data. And I mean, I will say one thing, you know, the states have to report the, the data to CMS. So one simple thing to do is just to ask them to report or to post somewhere on the website each of the monthly reports that they are sending to CMS. It doesn't have to be fancy. I mean, it you know, it's nice if it is, and it's all compiled and easily downloadable, but advocates could work with that. And, you know, that would be a comprehensive set of data, and you'd be able to track it over time. So, you know, and, and, and to me, that is just a simple thing and a simple request. So I um, would encourage for advocates who are uh, trying to work with their states, you know, I'm sure they've probably already made that suggestion, but um, 
that might be one way to uh, encourage a state that hasn't so far committed to doing so to, to change their mind. Great, thanks. Um, and for Sandy, we know since you talked about ex parte renewals, we know those will be one of the best tools to keep people covered because it's much more seamless and much less burdensome on people on Medicaid than having to send out a mail notice and having them send it back. As you get data reports on what's happening with the unwinding, um, what will you look for and what should advocates work for in states to, um, on like the ex parte renewal rates to try and increase and improve those? That's a great question. Um, you know, like I said, Nevada has just recently expanded our ex parte. I don't know that there's much, I mean, really ex parte is a matter of matching to data sources. And so if the data is available and, and is reliable, we will use it to process the applications. And so maybe just explaining if they get a notice in the mail that says they've been renewed, that there's nothing they need to do. They don't need to call anyone, you know, and, and take up that time that it's just the process has worked. So that's, I think, the only thing we could ask. Yeah, I think that's a great clarification um, because that will be the confirmation they're still covered um, and nothing is else is needed from them. Yeah. And Allison, as you were describing the issues that the DC Healthcare Alliance population faced and that research were started and then stopped and started again, what do you think DC should have done um, at some point during the process to um, keep people covered, make the process more seamless that might be relevant to what the rest of the country will experience soon? Yeah, I think maybe if they had done something um, similar to what Nevada did, um, as Sandy described, so telling people it's time to recertify, seeing if you get the packet back, um, and if you don't, just automatically extend them and just look at that data for the first couple of months to see, you know, are we are people dropping off? Are these are they actually responding um, and kind of adjusting what you're doing accordingly? I think also, um, you know, making sure notices are going out in the languages that people need um, or if there's um, a lot of my clients got uh, messages on their phones in English um didn't not understanding what they what they needed to do so language access yeah that's so important um and then i think the last question and this can be for everyone we heard from both allison and jennifer canary in the coal mine um so as we hit april 1st and going into the first couple months and you may have already touched on some of these but what are like the top things that you'll be looking for either in the data or as you hear and talk to people on Medicaid, um, what are the like top red flags that you're gonna be moder monitoring and what can people on that call do you think do with those red flags as they come up? Well, I can uh, jump in. Um, so I, I do think, right, the, the call center data uh, will be, uh, and call center volume important to monitor. But, um, you know, a key metric that I will be focused on is the um, share of disenrollments that are occurring for procedural reasons. So some of the things that Allison talked about where people, you know, they, they, they weren't denied, individuals weren't denied, so they weren't determined ineligible, but they were simply kicked off the system. Uh, or kicked off of coverage. Um, and, you know, in some cases, it may be because the individual didn't take action. But as we learned from Allison's presentation, that in other cases, it can be a systems failure on the state side. And so um, I think that is going to be a really important metric. I mean, we, we do know that people, that there are millions of people uh, who are currently on coverage who are no longer eligible. And that's because during the intervening three years in which they had coverage, they've gotten a new job, had an increase in income. But, and so, you know, those people moving those folks off coverage and helping them transition to other coverage is important. But 
really those people who remain eligible but are losing coverage anyway are the, the people that we need to be concerned about because those people will become uninsured. They have nowhere else to go to get coverage and their, their coverage is being, um, in many cases, terminated inappropriately. So, you know, I think that, that like across all states will be sort of the, the key metric that um, we will be looking at and, and monitoring. Thanks. And Sandy, did you wanna jump in here too? Sure. I think um, from a statewide perspective, outside of just Medicaid, I think in addition to everything that, that Jen just explained, I think we, we would be interested in those who do get transferred to the exchange if they actually enroll in coverage, and if not, why? Because as a state, outside of Medicaid, we don't want our uninsured rate to go up. That's one of our overarching goals, um, and it always has been. So this has really been an opportunity for us to find those opportunities to make the system and the process better um, so that we don't have a, a large amount of uninsured. And, and with all the subsidies available right now at the marketplace, it, it shouldn't be that hard to get coverage within your income levels if you're not no longer eligible for Medicaid. It's just a matter of navigating and ensuring that that communication is out there, that, that there are subsidies and that we can reach those people that have been transferred to the marketplace so that's that's kind of key for us as well. Great. Well, I think that concludes the Q and A portion. I really want to thank you, Jen, Sandy, and Allison, for sharing your expertise today. And thank you, everyone who joined today. We hope the information presented was helpful as you prepare for the starter redeterminations in one month, and as red flags emerge over the year that this process will take. Um, and stay tuned for more information, webinars, and Medicaid coalition meetings from us. Like we're planning um, a in-person Medicaid coalition meeting for March 30th. It'll be our first in-person one since before the pandemic. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And a recording of the webinar and the slides will be up on the website soon if you want to come back to it. Um, and we just, thanks for joining and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.